All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for everything. And let me see here. All right. What happened to everybody? They went home, didn't come back. You must, you must have scared them off this morning. <laughs> must have. He probably got scared of false teachers. I guess scorpions. Afraid I was going to bring in some big scorpions. Somebody was able to turn on the TV and say, Jim Brown believes that scorpions going to attack the world. They was, some woman saw me making fun of the Pentecostal tongues people, and I was going, Shandala, Wandala, Shandai. And then she flipped on it, saw me do that, and then turned off. She said, he speaks in tongues. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't like me because I would spoke in tongues. She didn't see what I was doing. I was kind of laughing at that foolishness that goes on in those churches. We always get together and... Uh, and I continually share these letters with you. These are people that write from around the country, and they uh, see us on TV and the Internet throughout the world, and, and we're on TV all over the country, and they write to us. And Walter and Annette Blunt, they're in South St. Paul, Minnesota, and they regular supporters of the ministry and writing all the time. And they write, Brother Jim, Sister Mary, and all the Grace and Truth family. Greetings in the name of Jesus. You are constantly in our thoughts and prayers. May all be well with you. We're still enjoying the DVDs in the something. They are like seven-course meals with the, with the rarest desserts. They've shown us many revelations thank you and <clears throat> thank god for you may the lord bless thee and keep thee may he make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee may he give may he lift up his countenance upon thee may he give thee peace over there number 624 and uh walter and annette blunt we love you guys just keep on watching listening and we'll Keep getting the DVDs to you. Uh, William Perry writes from uh, Tucson, Arizona. Not the, not the refrigerator. I don't think that's him. I think this is another William Perry. Uh, we just sent something, just a thing here, called and chosen faithful. The Lamb shall overcome them. He is the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, and so forth. And he's a faithful supporter and listener, and we love you, William. Keep on watching. Keep listening. And then he's out in Tucson. And then uh, I thought, I think I may have read this. Now, Danny Huddy, he is, uh, he is in Alexandria, Kentucky. Uh, dear Jim Mary, my name is Danny Huddy. I live in Alexandria, Kentucky. The first thing I need to say, Jim, is I know who your double is on this planet. He is my dad. You two could be brothers. It just tickles me. I wanted to tell you that I've been going to a Baptist church for 14 or 15 years. I was involved in prison ministry for eight years. I've read the Bible from cover to cover a few times, but I understand your teaching, and you have made the Scripture so clear for me I want so much to come to your church, but I'm disabled, so I don't drive. I can't find a church around here that teaches the truth, and I can't bring myself to go back to a church that celebrates Christmas, and the pastor and the authorities in the church have ego the size of walls, and I can't tell anyone the truth because every time I say something about God or the Bible they that I've learned from you, which I've learned more from you than two classes in two classes than all the years I went to church where I don't get really shut up and I'm told I don't know what I'm talking about and they'll start telling me about how much they do <clears throat> how much they think they know 
I'm sorry for unloading on you. I'm just tired of all the lies and deceptions and the ego. I believe you have to die to self. You have to have a daily cross. Everything you preach, teach, makes so much more sense to me than anything I've been taught. And I want to support your awesome ministry. Thank you, Mary, for all you, that you do. I love the literature and the DVDs you sent me. I would love to get regular DVDs so I don't miss any truth. Uh, God bless you, Jim, and your whole house and all that you do in Christ Jesus, your brother in truth, Danny. I'm in closing this check, though I feel guilty because it's not a tenth of what I get from very tight on my budget, but I pray you can put it to good use. Thank you. Uh, forgive my handwriting. Well, we love you, Danny. Just keep on... Uh, Keep on doing as God deals with your heart. And Faye Jackson in Atlanta writes to us. And she, very faithful listener in Atlanta, viewer on TV there. And she writes and says, Dear Pastor and Grace and Truth family, received your DVDs today and was so grateful. You are so faithful and gracious to remember me, even though I sometimes am a little late writing, thanking and requesting more DVDs. I always benefit from them spiritually, and they arrive in the nick of time, especially when that that spiritual spiritual law depression state moves in. I have to refer to my signature Psalm 42. It always encourages me and closes my monthly offering to you as you see fit. Please take care. I uh, hope you and Mary are feeling better. Love, blessing, and peace, Faye Jackson. We love you, Faye. She's a dear lady and uh, really loves this truth. And I'll read one more here. Got a letter from uh, <clears throat> from uh, this is from Don and Jessica Malloy, and they're over in uh, in Knoxville, Tennessee. Dear Jim, Mary Grace, and Truth family, hello from Knoxville. I'd like to thank you again for the DVDs you send. I ask you to please keep us on the mailing list. Thank you for all your efforts in spreading truth. Our lives were changed when God put this ministry in our path. I love reading the word of the month, and my husband has been studying your videos and letting our neighbors know what we're learning from you. They were timid and troubled at first, but, but have uh, asked to know more. It goes... It gives us great pleasure when people we know latch on to the truth. I just hope it continues. I hope you all are doing well and pray God will continue to give you strength and perseverance for this ministry. It's been such a blessing. Love in Christ, Don and Jessica Malloy. And closed is to be used, whatever it's needed most. We love you guys. Just keep on. And uh, that'll be enough reading for right now. Hey. What are you doing? Brought somebody up. Huh? Brought somebody up. Brought somebody up. Brought somebody here. Oh, you hadn't been here? Oh, okay. We're glad you're here. We're glad you're here. <laughs> you got down here front. You're the closest to me. I'm going to dump most of this on you. Hey, I was worried about that when I walked up. Were you? Well, okay. I got some more letters. I just I don't have time to read them all. What was your name? What is you? Well, is you? We're glad to have you here. And uh, we've got water back there in the restrooms over here. And uh, glad you're here. Uh, remember our other announcements on we'll radio every Saturday morning, uh, WNQM 1300 on the AM dial. And, uh, and we'd like to invite to everybody to watch through the week. And uh, that's our TV locally. Of course, if you're in New Orleans, one in New Orleans, if you're in... Uh, Dallas, Fort Worth, Houston, Beaumont, San Antonio, or Austin. We're on TV there, and we're also on TV in Oklahoma City and Tulsa and Tucson and San Diego and Los Angeles and Seattle and 
in St. Paul, Minnesota, and Council Bluffs, Iowa, and Omaha, Nebraska, and Sioux City, Iowa, Dayton, Ohio, and Roanoke, Virginia, and a whole bunch more, Atlanta, and, and all over New York City. And it's, it does, you just can't believe that this small ministry has procured this much. And most of our, our uh, overhead that we have to pay in TV comes from out there. And we've got a small congregation here, uh, full on Sunday morning, and everybody gets tired and goes home. This is typical Sunday night for church people. But, uh, and we'd like to uh, remind you that we, uh, that we uh, try to help the needy and the poor. We've got some widow ladies struggling to stay alive. If they have one thing goes wrong in their family, one thing, they're stopped in their tracks. And we try to help these ladies. We got uh, Amanda Meadows out here in Murfreesboro. Her husband has, her husband has, uh, uh, has dialysis three times a week. I don't even know if they, I don't think they get much help from the government. They just keep running the bills up. And we try to help Amanda all we can. It's a dear lady, sweet lady, loves us true. And we try to give them, sometimes we give them a little cash and we'll give them food cards or gift cards is what they are. And you can pick up a gift card down here. At, uh, and all this goes to the needy. Uh, it's not just all the needy out here in the world. It's the people who are involved in the truth. And uh, if you want to contribute to them, you can pick up a $20, $30, $40 gift card, whatever you want to give. And you can get a Visa card. Uh, Twenty-five dollars or so, or you can, or you can pick up a, uh, uh, pick up a, a Walmart card or something like that, and all that goes to the needy. And then, if you want to send an offering to them, you can write a check, put the grace and truth on top of it, but put for the needy or benevolent fund on the bottom, and we uh, get that into the hands of the poor and the needy. And the Lord has been gracious. You've been gracious to give. And uh, all right. I guess that's everything, isn't it? All right. Well, let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer. And good to see Jeff here. Won't you pray for us? Okay. Our Father, which art in heaven, Lord, we thank you for allowing us to gather here tonight together as one body. Lord, we pray that you will witness in all the things that we do. We ask that you be with Brother Jim tonight as he brings us another portion of your word. God, help us to fight the self, this outer man that haunts us and, and help us to strive to embrace the fire, Lord. We ask that you bless all of those believers out there tonight and be with us all in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right. I'm ready. It's Sunday night, and our subject for the last year and a half at least has been the doctrine of the devil. There's only two doctrines in the Bible, and I heard the word doctrine when I was a kid, and I didn't have any idea what it meant. Didn't even know what it meant when I was grown. Whenever I teach, I teach from the original Greek text. That is the, that's called the Textus Receptus. Textus, let me write this down. Textus Receptus. That's a Latin word meaning the received text. Or they will call it the AV or authorized version. 
and you also have a title called Majority Text. And I go through that. I'll go through that another time. Text. Uh, there was no English 2,000 years ago when the Bible was written. I've said that to people and they go, really? No, they weren't in the English. <laughs> the Bible was not written in English. The New Testament was written in Greek. New Testament in Greek. Old Testament, Hebrew. And we have the Hebrew. Now, for those of you that want to learn, if you're watching and you want to learn, the first thing you get is a Strong's Exhaustive Concordance. This has every word in the Bible listed in it alphabetically. And in order to look up a word, you look up a word, you look it up alphabetically in the English, and there'll be a number to the side of it. And that number, if it's an Old Testament word, it'll be in the back in the Hebrew dictionary. And if it's a New Testament verse, word, it'll be in the New Testament in the back, and it'll give you the Greek word, tell you how to pronounce it. And after you've been coming here for some time, you'll get to where it's second nature. Uh, the New Testament is written in the Greek, and we have the Greek text. That's where you start. Then after, you, after you've been here a while, I'll teach you the Greek alphabet. You cannot translate Greek into English. Now, that really can't be done. We have to go back to the Greek word and find out what it means. You can use this as your dictionary, and I've got many dictionaries. I use more than a concordance. I've got a, my house looks like the public library when you walk in to it. It's a wall covered with book, books. But there's the Greek word, and the English is under it. I don't even use the English out of an interlinear Bible. You get any linear Bible, Mr. J.P. Green's in your linear, everybody needs one. And I'll show you how to use an analytical lexicon if you've been coming a while. And, and I'll teach you how to learn what the Bible actually means. Now, we've been talking about the doctrine of the devil. The, doctrine of the, the word doctrine is the word, it's one of two words, didache, or it is the word didaskalia, D-I-D-A-S-K-A-L-I-A. These are synonyms. Both of them mean instruction. So whenever somebody says doctrine, they mean instruction. And I've heard people say, well, doctrine doesn't matter. Doctrine is everything. Saying that doctrine doesn't matter is like saying I bought a new computer and I just started plugging in plugs just anywhere. And I just started tapping on the keys and plugged it in and, and smoke started coming out of it. I wonder why. Well, did you follow instruction? Well, no, I just plugged it in. I figured it'd work. You have to follow instructions. And the Bible is specific instructions. When you're talking about instruction, you're talking about information or you're talking about something that is exact. You're talking about exactness. You cannot leave, as I said this morning, you cannot leave the definition of a word behind. You can't do that. You leave the definition of a word behind. You leave the meaning behind. If I'm out in public and I'm talking to somebody and I'm witnessing somebody, people say, how do you witness when you believe in predestination? You just teach them something. If they have a hearing ear, the hearing ear and the seeing eye of the Lord hath made even both of them. If they can hear, they'll hear what you're saying. If God's given them an ear to hear. So you have to learn to, I'll give them something simple. I'll usually give them the Greek word prayer. I'll always give this word out, prayer. And this, and people can't, can't keep from agreeing with you what prayer means. I'll tell them. I'll say, well, I teach things that other people don't teach. They say, well, like what? I'll say, well, I teach the Greek text, and I'll teach you that words don't mean what people say. Like, for instance, the word prayer. And I'll tell them, the word prayer, I'll tell them there's one word in the Greek text for the word prayer. I always say one word. That way they can't say, well, isn't there some other word? I say, no, there's one word for the word prayer. It comes from pros, it's the word prosukomai. In the original Greek text of the New Testament, it's either prosukuma or prosuke. Prosuke. This word prosukuma is the verb, and this is the noun. It's just a, you have a noun and a verb form of the noun. One is pray, the other is the word prayer. 
Uh, one is pray, that's the verb. Prayer is the noun. Well, this comes from pros. This is what I'll tell them, pros and UK. Now, they can, anybody can understand this. I'll, then I'll tell them pros is our word pro. I'll say, you know what pro means, don't you? Pro-life, for life, toward life. They'll say, yes, I understand that. And UK means to will or desire. I said, this means to will or desire toward the will of another. Now, that's the meaning of the word. Then I'll say over there in Matthew, the sixth chapter, Jesus tells us how to pray. We pray, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. And then I emphasize real loud and clear, thy will be done. He tells us to pray, thy will be done. And then he, then he went to the garden the night that he was going to die in the 26th chapter of Matthew, and he prayed, Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, thy will be done. I tell them that real loud and clear. I'll say, thy will be done. I say, you understand that. So prayer means to bow to the will of God. It does not mean to say, Lord, give me a job making $40 an hour and heal my mother and uh, fix my situation and let me get out of all these problems. Amen. I love you. I'm sorry, but praying for somebody to be healed is not true. Inevitably, some of them will turn around and say, well, pray for me that I'll get this job. And I say, I can't do that. I'm going to pray for the will of God in your life. I'll have people call me on the phone and they'll say, Brother, would you pray for me and put me on your prayer list? I've been sick. Well, so I'll pray for the will of God in your life. And if, he, and if he wants you to stay sick, God heals who he wants to heal. But God does not heal by our words. And Benny Hinn don't heal anybody. And God don't listen to that because Benny Hinn is a false teacher. Now, these guys don't know. These false teachers who preach the doctrine of the devil, they don't know the meaning of these things. Uh, all the charismatics say all you have to do is pray and believe and you get it. Well, they preach the doctrine of the devil. That's what they preach. There's two doctrines in the Bible. There's the doctrine of the devil. Two doctrines in the Bible. The devil's doctrine and Christ's doctrine. And it's very simple. The devil's doctrine fulfills self. Self. It is actually the lifting up of self. And Christ's doctrine is death to self. Death to self. That's basically everything in the Bible, every story, every Bible story. It matters not if you're talking about Daniel and he's doing the will of God by, by getting on his knees in his window while, while the, the emissaries of these adversaries of his who had gone to Darius and gotten him to issue a decree that anyone who asked anything of any other god <coughs> other than of Darius for 30 days, they had to be thrown in the lion's den. Darius loved Daniel, but they tricked him. Well, even whenever you see that, <coughs> you've got two men here. You've got Daniel bowing to the will of God. You've got his adversaries bowing to their own will and trying to scheme against him. Of course, eventually they end up in the lion's den. Daniel ends up delivered. So the doctrine of the devil, <coughs> 1 Timothy 4.1. The scripture says, In the latter times, some shall depart from the faith. Depart from faith. And they'll give heed to seducing spirits. Seducing spirits, and doctrines of devils. In the latter times, men are going to depart from faith. We've studied faith. Faith obeys God. Faith crucifies self. One of my favorite verses Whenever you hear a charismatic say this, or even a Baptist, they'll say, well, the Bible says faith is a substance of things hoped for. Faith is substance. And I'll hear them say, substance is stuff. It's cars. 
its cars, its houses. Don't you believe that? That's a lie. That's a lie. That's not the meaning of the word. Faith is substance of things hoped for, of things hoped for. This word substance, of course, we know it's not houses and stuff. And cars. I've heard Fred Bryce say, well, that's houses and things and stuff and cars and money and jobs. And No, it's not, Freddie. Here's what it is right here. The word is hypostasis. And that word, hypostasis, is a construction of hypo and stasis. Hypo means under, under. That's a common prefix. You find it all the time in front of words in the Greek. Hypo means under. Hypo means above. And stasis means to stand or be upright. You have many words that come from the word stasis. You have the word histome and stao. Stao means to stand. Histome means upright. And this word stasis means to be upright. And we get the word staros. Staros is the Greek word cross. Cross. So, hypostasis, and it also means, this word means to understand. It means to understand. It has the idea of an understanding. An understanding, this word hypo, another word would be sub, and something that stands is a structure. And a substructure is a foundation. A foundation. So everything that's built in our lives is built upon the foundation, which is hypostasis and understanding. And if you understand, you learn, and this is how you build your life. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. This word hoped is the word E-L-P-I-Z-O. It comes from the word E-L-P-I-S, and it means it means to depend on promises that have been made by God in this case. Now the promises are already written down in the Word. You say, what are those promises? Well, eternal life. How about, I promise you, Jesus says, in the world you shall have tribulation. How about that? How, you like that promise? Huh? You don't like that one. Philipsis. Philipsis. That's the word tribulation every time you find it. That's every time you find it in the Greek text. Tribulation. Philipsis. It means to be to go through trials, excruciating trials. When Paul went on his first missionary journey, I'll show you what he said tribulation was. When he went on his first missionary journey, he left up here at Caesarea. That's what we call Syria right here. Here's Israel down here, and there's Lebanon. That was old ancient Tyre and Sidon. And he left here with Barnabas, and they went over here. John Mark was with them too. Went over here to Cyprus. And then he came up and hit the coast of Pamphylia. Then he went up to four cities in this yellow spot in here. And that yellow spot is Galatia. It's approximately Galatia. I'm not going to say it's exactly Galatia. But that's what we call Turkey and they call this Asia Minor on the western end. Well, Galatia was this area right here. Galatia was a state. It wasn't a town. He would write to cities like Corinth. He would write to a city like Philippi. But Galatia was cities. And the first place he stopped, he went up here to Antioch. He had several Antiochs because Antioch comes from Antiochus. And you find Antiochus being spoken about, his prophecy being spoken about over in, man, we get the word Antioch from that, and he's one of the solution kings. You had several Antiochus, Antiochus Epiphanes, Antiochus the God, uh, and several others. Well, he went over here, and he comes up here to a place called Antioch. He preached there in the 13th chapter of Acts, and the Jews in the synagogue there, he'd go to the synagogue on Saturday, so he could preach to the Jews against their false doctrine and their false teaching, their halakha. I don't have time to go into it, 
but that was the verbal law of the Jews where they twisted the word of God. And he went over there and preached to them, preached Christ. And he said, and that's where he said, Acts 13, 48, he said, as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. And from that day forward, they didn't like the idea that God only had certain people ordained to eternal life. And they started speaking against Paul, and they left Paul. And when they left him, they pulled away from him, and then they got together and buzzed around. And then he said, let's go kill him. And they ran him out of town, and they ran him off about 75 miles away over to a place called Iconium. Well, Paul went over to Iconium. He goes to Antioch. He goes to Antioch. And then he goes to Iconium. And this is in Galatia. So if you study the book of Galatians, you got to study this. He went to Antioch, then went to Iconium. And these Jews from Antioch, they were so mad at him that they, here's Antioch, here's Iconium over here, about 75 miles away. And Paul went over here to Iconium, and he's going to preach to them the next Saturday, the next Sabbath. When he goes over there, he preaches to them, and these guys are so angry back over here, these Jews of the synagogue, they go over there, and they stir up the people at Iconium, and they run him out of town, and he goes down to Lystra, some miles away down there. I don't know exactly how many, maybe 20 or 30 miles away, maybe, maybe 15, somewhere between 15 and 30. He goes down to Lystra, and at Lystra, these same Jews who had traveled all the way down here for the following week, and then down here for the following week, they ran him out of Iconium. These guys stirred up these people over here to run him out of town, and he comes down to Lystra. And let's look at that. Let's see what happens at Lystra. Over here in, in Acts, well, I'm explaining to you what tribulation is. And this is one of the promises of God. You have to have tribulation in order to go to heaven. If you never, ever open your mouth and tell people the truth and then get angry at you, they're not going to be angry at you for an easy gospel or walk the aisle and accept Christ's gospel, which isn't true. They're not going to be angry at that. People are going to have to be angry at you for preaching truth. Tell them Christmas is paganism, has nothing to do with Jesus. Easter is paganism. God does not love everybody. He loved Jacob and hated Esau before they were born. <laughs> when you tell them as many as were ordained to eternal life will believe, and you don't have to convince anybody of anything. The hearing ear and the seeing eye of the Lord hath made even both of them. If God deafens a man's ear, he says he's going to deafen people's ears, he's going to blind their eyes, and it's because he doesn't want them. So when you get over here to Acts 13, Paul is at Lystra, this third town in Galatia. <clears throat> Let's look at it. 13th chapter. And he gets over here to Lystra and... Excuse me, I'm, I've got you in the wrong chapter. I'm talking about the 14th chapter. The 13th chapter is his message over it. The 13th chapter is his message at Antioch. They run him out of town. He leaves and goes to Iconium in the 51st, chapter, 51st verse of the 13th chapter. Then in Acts 14, when he's at Iconium, these same Jews, when he's at Iconium, these same Jews from Antioch come down here. They were the Jews of the synagogue. And Paul was up there correcting their halakha. And I'm telling you one of the promises of God. This is what you have to go through. <clears throat> and in verse 8, Paul flees to the, he fled to Lystra and Derby in verse 6, uh, cities of Lyconia and the region that lieth about, and there they preached the gospel. And there sat a certain man at Lystra, impotent in his feet, being a cripple from his mother's womb, that's in verse 8, who never had walked. The same heard Paul speak, who steadfastly beholding him, perceiving that he had faith to be healed. Faith to be healed? You mean, I thought you couldn't be healed by faith. By the way, that word healed right there is the word sozo. In case you didn't know that. Saved. Saved. Every time... Saved. 
every time the Bible says thy faith is made thee whole, every time it's always the word sozo, saved, not physically healed. And Jesus would never heal a vessel of wrath fitted to destruction that's not going to live for him. He would never heal a person like that to go out and live for themselves, would he? Never. He only healed believers. So faith to be healed would be God only saves people who believe him. Or he only heals people who believe him. He, will, he would heal a man, but the man's faith is not what's, what healed him. When the woman with the issue of blood in Mark the fifth chapter, <laughs> these guys who preach faith healing is absolutely wrong. It's just false doctrine. When the woman had the issue of blood, she came and touched him of Jesus' garment. And he turned to her and he said, Thy faith has made thee whole. Go and be whole of thy plague. He said, Thy faith has made thee whole. So faith made her whole. Go be whole of thy plague. The first word whole is not the same word in the Greek text as the second word whole. The first word whole is the word sozo, saved. Jesus did not heal her because of her faith. He saved her because of her faith. And he, since she was a believer, he says, Now, go and be whole of thy hugius. Go and be whole of your physical ailment. But she wasn't made whole from her physical ailment. She was saved because of her faith. And every time the Bible says, Thy faith has made thee whole, it's that word sozo. That's the word saved. What must I do to be sozo? What must I do to be saved? So, we're, so when we're talking about this, where was I over here? I gave that to you for a reason. Oh, I'll get back to it. Let's get over here. Oh, it was here in verse 9. Perceiving that he had faith to be healed, <coughs> to be saved, said with a loud voice, Stand upright on thy feet, and he leaped and walked. When the people saw what Paul had done, but it wasn't Paul, they lifted up their voices, saying in the speech of Lyconia, The gods are come down unto us in the likeness of men. This Paul and Barnabas are gods. And they called Barnabas Jupiter... And they called Paul Mercurius because he was the chief speaker. And Mercury was the interpreter of the gods among these people. And among the Greeks, he was called Hermes. And when you, it means interpreter. If you go to a seminary, you'll take, take a, a course in hermeneutics. That means interpretation of the Bible. Now, I don't know why they would name that after a pagan god, but they did. I wouldn't name it after a pagan god. Now, they called Barnabas Jupiter and Paul Mercurius because he was the chief speaker. Then the priest of Jupiter, which was before their city, brought oxen and garlands under the gates and would have done sacrifice with the people. They're ready to sacrifice to Paul and Barnabas. And they're here at Lystra. These people really like, they like Paul and Barnabas. And they, Paul and Barnabas could have done, could have done what, they could have done what most preachers would do, just absorb and soak up that adoration and that glory. Couldn't they? But they said, don't you call us gods. We're not gods. But they're just giving all them this all this adulation and looking up to them and telling them how wonderful they are and saying, Sirs, why do you these things? We also are men like passions with you and preach unto you that ye should turn from these vanities unto the living God which made heaven and earth and the sea. So Paul starts correcting them for offering what offer sacrifices to him and calling him a God. And all things that are therein. 
who in times past suffered all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he left not himself without witness in that he did good and gave us rain from heaven in fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. He says, God is the one that does this, not me. I'm not a God. And with these sayings, scarce restrained they the people that they had done sacrifice unto him. And there came thither certain Jews from Antioch. These guys come down to Iconium, then they come to Lystra. They're coming from Antioch. They're Jews of the synagogue that hate Paul for coming up there and telling him their ritual traditional laws are a lie. They're preaching against false teachers. When you preach against false teachers, this is what happens. People get mad enough at you, they want to kill you when you tell them, God does not love everybody. He loved Jacob and hated Esau. Before either one were born for it, either one had done any good or evil. That's what the ninth chapter of Romans says. When Rebekah had conceived by one, even by father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to the election might stand, it was said unto her, not of works, but of him that calleth, it was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger, Esau will serve Jacob. They were twins come out of the womb. And Esau was born first. And it says, The elder shall serve the younger. God said this to Rebekah. There in the 25th chapter of Genesis, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. Before they were born. You tell that to somebody. You read it. You can read it out of a King James Bible and say, Look, read this. I don't want to see that. I have people do that. I don't want to look at that. God doesn't love... God loves everybody. He does not. He didn't, he's never said he loved everybody. He loved his wife, the church, and gave himself for her, nobody else. If he loved everybody, he'd have died for everybody, wouldn't he? He died for his wife, and he knew exactly who she was, every person in the wife, in the bride, long before any of, any of us were born. He knew us, for whom he did foreknow. Foreknow, prognosco, means to know intimately ahead of time. He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. Now, let's read on here. And they couldn't restrain these. So there came, verse 19, thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium who persuaded the people. These are Jews coming from Antioch. They come over and really twisted the Jews at Iconium and they come down here and persuade the people at Lystra who first of all began to look up to Paul and to Barnabas and said, you're gods. But these are the guys in the 13th chapter that Paul ripped them apart with the truth. Do you realize this is at least two weeks later? How angry do you have to be to stay just furious for two weeks till you can catch this guy and say, let's kill him? That's how bad they wanted to get Paul. And they talked the people into taking him outside the city of Lystra. I'm telling you one of the things that God promises you. This word El Pizzo means to depend on a promise. But who gets to come up with the promises? You? I hope I get a diamond ring. I hope I win the lottery. The guy kept praying over and over every day, Lord, let me win the water. lottery. Let me win the lottery. A voice came out of the sky one day and said, you're going to have to buy a ticket. <laughs> but hope means to depend on the promises that have already been made. And everything that God promised us is going to, he promises eternal life. Let's finish and see this promise here. There came thither certain Jews from Antioch and from Iconium and persuaded these people at Lystra. Antioch is about here. Iconium is about here. Lystra is just down a little below that. And a town called Derby is just below that. So whenever you're reading, whenever you're reading the book of Galatia, you've got to study the 13th to the 15th chapter of Acts. Because that's where Paul is in Galatia. And these are the four cities of Galatia that he was writing to. And there came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium and persuaded people and having stoned Paul drew him out of the city supposing he had been dead. Now why would they suppose he were dead just throwing rocks at him? That's not the way they stoned somebody. 
they take them up on a hill. They could find a 18, 20 foot hill. They would throw them down. They might even bind their hands, throw them down, hoping it'll break their neck or break their back. And then they would take great big huge stones, 20, 25 pounds, and throw them down on them. So Paul is busted all two pieces. For what? For preaching the truth at Antioch and calling these false teachers down for their lies. It was the halal call he was calling down. The law call is the verbal law of the Jews when they were carried into captivity from Babylon. And they translated the, the law, 613 laws in the book of the law, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And they translated over into the Babylonian Aramaic. When they translated it, they put their spin on these laws and they split their spin and twisted the law and they call that the halakha or the traditional law of the Jews. And it was a twisting of the word of God. It was twisting the word and they, and they built the synagogue of Babylon in Babylon And it was this halakha that Paul was correcting up here in the synagogue at Antioch. So they, they despise him for that, and they're going to get him and kill him. Now here's what God has promised us. Let's look and see. <clears throat> Having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. He looked like he had been in a car hitting a brick wall going about 100 miles an hour. They probably had him bound up in splints everywhere. Just had him tied up, probably had a bunch of broken bones. Howbeit, as the disciples stood round about him, he rose up and came into the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas and went down to Derby. That's about 10 miles or so down the road from Lystra. He went down to Derby, and when they had preached the gospel in that city, and had taught many, they returned to Lystra. Paul's going back here, he's a glutton for punishment. Either that or he loves God so much that he wants to go back and check on the saints there. Because these guys, the guys from Antioch during that time period have gone back home. And they're the guys that were stirring things up at Lystra. And to Iconium and then to Antioch. Paul takes the same path back. He leaves Derby, goes back up to Lystra, goes back up to Iconium, and goes back over to Antioch just to check on the saints. He was a very brave man because these people were after him for correcting their false doctrine, the doctrine of the devil. It's a doctrine of the devil even if it has God's word in it, but if it's twisted with a bunch of false doctrine, like you can, you can be saved or you can be healed with your faith, that's not true. Proof that faith does not heal. I've got a t-shirt I had on the back of it. I had the words put, put on it. If faith could heal, nobody would die of old age. Did you know that? If faith could heal, you couldn't die of old age because there's no such disease as old age. There's not, you don't open a, a medical book and say, he died of old age. I mean, professors don't write that down. They write, he died of a pulmonary uh, edema or he died of uh, uh, died of uh, pneumonia with a pulmonary disease died of cardiac arrest they have a name for it everyone who dies of natural causes which we call old age it's a deterioration or diseased bodies and your circulatory system gives out or your pulmonary system gives out and your heart stops beating that's because it's diseased everybody here is diseased if disease could heal, if faith could heal, you would stop aging. Your gray hair would come to a halt. That's all the gray hair you'd ever have. You'd have no more of these wrinkles. That would stop. Old age, you, and I keep saying, when you're 90, your faith is stronger than it is at 30, isn't it? And you've been growing all that time. Then why is it some of these faith healers say, well, you can be healed at 30, but when you get to be 90... And your body is coming to pieces because of disease. Nobody can be healed at that age. You don't ever see 90-year-olds in Benny Hinn's crusade coming down there. You ever notice that? That don't never happen. 90-year-olds coming down there going, 
<laughs> you me, Benny. Whap, you know. That's, it's just a lie. Now look here. Here's the promise of God. When they had preached the gospel, they came to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch. Verse 22, confirming the souls, they went back to confirm the people of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must through much tribulation enter the kingdom of God. Philipsis. Philipsis has to do with people coming after us, hating us. It's not being behind on your car note or behind on your rent or short on groceries. Tribulation is people coming after you. That's like the word persecution. When, when Paul said to Timothy, he spoke of... Look, let me show you. Go to 1 Timothy, or 2 Timothy. Go to 2 Timothy. When Paul says these words, he's talking about to Timothy. Timothy is pastoring the church at Ephesus. Remember, Ephesus is on the southeast corner of what we call Turkey. That was Asia Minor, down here on the coast. That's where they had shrines to dine. Timothy was pastoring there, and Paul is talking to Timothy about some things that happened to him at Antioch. Iconium, Derby, Lystra. He's talking to him about it, and he says so. Look here. Look here in 2 Timothy 3, verse 10. Timothy, thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, my instruction, my manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me, yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. The word is dioko. This is the word persecution. It means to flee Piercing. And when we are pierced, Paul said, or Peter said, in, in 1 Peter 4 and 12, Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. It is not strange when fiery trials happen. He says, think it not strange, X-E-N-I-Z-O, Knizzo. Comes from the word X-E-N-O-S, which is the word stranger or an occasional guest. The fiery trial is not an occasional guest. It's required in the life of every believer. The fiery trial, which is to try you. That word tries the word P-E-I-R-A-S-M-O-S. -E it comes from the word perazzo, P-E-I-R-A-Z-O, which means to pierce. You could actually say this word parazzo, that's the word try, to try you in 1 Peter 4 and 12. You could say that this word parasmos is related to the word persecute because that means to flee, piercing, and this means to pierce. Oh, by the way, the word scorpion, it's K-O-R-P-I-O-S. We said this morning, scorpions are false teachers in the ninth chapter of Revelation. It means to pierce. So a scorpion pierces, and parasmos, the fiery trials of daily life, pierce, and Paul equates that with what happened to him, and he promises us, we must through much tribulation. How about that for our hope? If you go through persecution, you can depend, and if it's for righteousness sake, it's not being persecuted for somebody for stealing their parking place or for stealing money from them. No. We're blessed. We're blessed. Well, look here. Matthew says it. Jesus says it in Matthew 5. And Matthew 5, and he's talking to the blessed ones on the side of the mountain here at the beginning of this message, uh, this Sermon on the Mount, 
And he says in Matthew the fifth chapter, Matthew 5, in verse 11, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you. Aniizo means to defame. O-N-E-I-D-I-Z-O. O-N-E-I-D-I-Z-O. Defame. Not when you become famous. When you're defamed. The word, it comes from anias, an, aniizo, which means to be infamous. When you preach Christmas is Christ Mass, it's Roman Catholicism, that don't make you famous. <laughs> Not in America. That makes you infamous, doesn't it? When, when we say these truths that, that Easter was the resurrection of Tammuz in the ancient world, and they didn't have a one-time-a-year resurrection that they celebrated for Christ, they celebrated that every first day of the week because that's the day that He rose from the dead. And all the apostles got together on the first day of the week. They didn't do it one time a year at Ishtar. Ishtar was the mother, wife, sometimes his mother, sometimes his wife in mythology, and she resurrected Tammuz at Ishtar, and they took that, and they renamed it Easter or Ostera or any number of names in different cultures. That was the resurrection of Tammuz, not Jesus. Do I believe that Jesus rose from the dead? Yes. But Ishtar doesn't have anything to do with it. In Christmas, Christ's Mass is the feast of Saturn. I don't have time to even go into that. When you start telling people these truths about the Bible and people don't even study. Billy Graham don't study. I listen to him. What's in a man's heart comes out of his mouth. If a man studied, he will learn these things. So Paul says we must see much tribulation. Now let me give it to you from Jesus himself. Go to the 16th chapter of John. Same word Paul used. How about if it's in red letters, it's Jesus' words, isn't it? Huh? It's Jesus' words. Okay. He's given a discourse to his apostles here. And when we look at verse 32, Behold, the hour cometh, yea, and it's now come that you shall be scattered every man to his own, and shall leave me alone, and yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. This is Jesus' words. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation. Same word Paul used. Men are going to persecute you and want to come after you for telling the truth and calling down false teachers. I have more people get mad at me over calling down false teachers. And I prove it with the words that they preach. I'll tell them that's not what the Bible says. And they'll just come up and make stuff up. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. <clears throat> I have overcome the world. Remember the word overcome? The word overcome is the word nikao. N-I-K-A-O. Overcome. N-I-K-A-O. That's the verb. Remember, in the Greek, you got a verb and you have a noun form. The noun is, the noun is, n i k e. It's the word victory. I'm quite sure the people who made Nike shoes took this old ancient Greek word and pulled it forward and says, "You'll have the victory if you wear Nike. You gotta run everybody." Well, what is this victory that overcomes the world? Look at First John. He says, when you have tribulation, I overcome the world. Look at 1 John. Fifth chapter. 1 John 5. You know, I can find my way here. My Bible's coming apart. Time for another one. All right. 1 John 5. 1 John 5, verse 4. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. That word overcome is the word nikao. The same word as you find over there where Jesus said in John 16, I've overcome the world. And this is the victory, the nike, that overcometh the world, even our death to self. 
What is it that makes you get over this frustration in the world? Dying to it. If you can never fulfill the flesh, and let me tell you, at 73 years old, I can tell you, it's never going to happen. The Bible says the man that loves silver. Well, I love that verse. Let's read it one more time. Over in Ecclesiastes, the fifth chapter. Solomon wrote this when he was an old man. Fit five. He says, I read it a couple of weeks ago. I'm going to read it again. Look at verse 9. Ecclesiastes 5. Moreover, the profit of the earth is for all. It's not for a few like Bill Gates and, and uh, Rupert Murdoch and, and uh, Warren Buffett and the big rich guys in the world and the Rothschilds and the J.P. Morgans. The profit of the world is for all. The king himself is served by the field. He that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver. You can never fill up the hole in your soul how are you going to get over this? Nor he that loveth abundance with increase. Does anybody like to get a lot of stuff and things and stuff and things and stuff? Does anybody like that? Has anybody ever wanted more in your life? Want more covetousness? Is idolatry. Have you been an idolater? Have you covetousness. Pleonectes is the word. And this is all it means. Want more. Have you ever wanted more square footage? I just got to have more square footage in my house. I just got to have more carrots in my diamond ring. I just got to have more car. I know my car is three years old, but I just got to have a new one. You ever wanted more? Been guilty there? I have. I have to watch myself to do that now. But the more you get, the more you want. That's what he said here. And you will never, ever, ever. I found that stuff doesn't satisfy. It absolutely does not. No matter how much stuff you get. And then he says, <clears throat> it's, huh? We're in Ecclesiastes 5. Then he says in verse 10, one of my favorite verses concerning this not being satisfied. He that loveth silver will not be satisfied with silver. You want more when you get lots of silver. And silver was the method of, of buying and selling back then. Nor he that loveth abundance with increase. This also is vanity. It's all vanity and vexation of spirit. Vexation is a Hebrew word that means to grasp for the wind. Have you ever tried to grab the wind while it's blowing by? When you go after money and things and stuff, and that is the meaning of the word devil or demon or demonion, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devil. The word is demonion, D-A-I-M-O-N-I-O-N. And that word demonion is our word demon, the word demon is not in the King James Bible. It's not there. Don't look for it. If you have a concordance, look up the word devil. And you'll have one of two words. You'll either have daemonion or you have diabolos. And every time you find this word daemonion, it's our word demon. And daemonion comes from the root dio, meaning to distribute fortunes. That's the very essence of this nation we live in. Capitalism. You can look that up in the Webster's Dictionary and it will tell you it means to distribute fortunes to the individual of railroads and companies and factories. Capitalism has the same exact meaning as demon. And isn't the love of money the root of all evil? Isn't that what it is? How do you get over the love of money? But the love of money is not what people think it is. The love of money is just the love of self. Because the love of money is one word there in the 6th chapter of 1 Timothy. One word in the Greek. Love of money is one word. It's the word philogoria. That's the word. Love of money. 
constructed of two words, philos, meaning to have an affection for. Augury. And augury means shining or silver. <coughs> we get our word A-R-G-U-E in this word augury. When a man argues, he wants to shine above his adversary with his argument. Oh, yeah? Well, I'll tell you. Have you ever seen anybody win one of those? Don't work, does it? I've had arguments in my life when I was younger. I don't do that anymore. I just walk away and say, well, you're probably right, and I've got to go now. I've never won an argument right in the middle of it. I used to get yelling. Somebody yell at me. And, and you never do see two guys yell, well, I'll tell you this, well, I'll tell you this. And one of them goes, oh, well, you know, I see what you're saying. Right in the middle of it. You ever seen that happen? Never. It's just the love of shining. The only reason men want silver so they can shine above others. That diamond ring, that car out in the driveway, that big fancy home, fancy furniture, everything that I want for me. It's just the love of self. And the Bible says demons are self. Jesus says in Mark, the first chapter, he sees a man in the temple with an unclean spirit, and it's the same thing as the demon, according to Luke 4. Luke's account of the same man. Luke says he has an unclean demon. Mark says he has an unclean spirit, and Jesus rebukes him. Rebukes A-U-T-O. That's our word, A-U-T-O. Automobile is self-mobile. He rebukes self. Well, when you see here in Ecclesiastes, he that loveth silver will not be satisfied with silver, nor he that loveth abundance with increase. When goods are increased, they are increased that eat them, this also is vanity. What good is it to the owners thereof except to look at it, the beholding of it with their eyes? All you can do is take your bank book out and look at it and count it. And then if you have enough when you're dead, maybe your family can fight over it. It don't make any sense. How do you get over this? How do you get over this never, ever having enough? You kill it off. You kill off self. And Paul says, faith is, uh, the right of Hebrews says, faith is substance. That's understanding. That's hypostasis. Hupo means understasis, means to stand. When you understand, you're a learner. The common word for learner that we've translated over into English is the word disciple. And learner is the word mathetes. We get our word mathematics from that. So when you're a learner and you're a disciple, you have understanding when you learn, and that's substance, and that's what faith is. But how do you learn? How do you learn and have understanding? Jesus said, well, let's read it. Let's just read his words in Luke 14. Luke 14, Luke 14, let's read this verse 26 and 27. And people don't like, boy, I've read this verse and people get upset. They don't, I'm going to read to you out of a King James Bible. And I'm going to emphasize what the meaning of it is. You read this to people and they go, oh, 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 that don't mean that. It means something else. No, it doesn't. It means what it says. Look at verse 26. Well, Jesus, Scripture says in verse 25, There went great multitudes with Jesus, and he turned and said unto them. This is Jesus talking. It's red letters, isn't it? If any man come to me and hate not his father and his mother and his wife, and children, and brethren, and sisters, yea, and his own life also. You can't be my learner. You can't be my disciple and understand and have faith. Somewhere you got to hate. What is it you hate in them? 
the previous verses to this verse is talking about a man having a man having a festival for his dear friends, and they refuse to come, and so they go out and get the lame and the halt and the blind, and some come up and they start making excuses. I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I got to go check out my new lawnmower. I I have married a wife, and she won't let me come to Grace and Truth. I got a good excuse. You know what excuses are? Excuses. That's all they are. <laughs> They're not worth anything. So he's saying, anyone who does not love the Word of God, anything in them you have to hate that's not Christ in them. Remember, Paul said we've got two people in us. In Romans, the seventh chapter, he says we've got an inner man which is Christ in you and the outer man which is self. Serves the law of the flesh. If a person has never been born again, there's nothing in a person to love. The only thing you can love in a person is Christ. And as you live through the years, that inner man grows and grows and grows. And fire and trials burns out the outer man of arrogance and pride and contention and strife and all this that I want my way. It burns it up over the years. And this is what has to happen. Now he says here, so if a person has no inner man getting rid of the outer man, I don't care if it's your mother. You can't love anything in her. What are you going to love? In a selfish, arrogant, conceited, uh, striving, contentious person. What are you going to love in them and they don't have any Christ in them? That's when we get into those verses about we to withdraw from people who walk disorderly. We to withdraw from people that have another doctrine. Mark them which cause divisions and offenses that are contrary to the doctrines you've learned. And avoid these people. If they have a contrary doctrine, get away from them. That's what the Bible says. If anyone preaches any other doctrine in 2 John 6, 2 John 10, any other doctrine, do not bid them God's speed. Caro, do not be cheerful to them. Charis is the word grace. Do not be gracious to them. It comes from caro. Do not caro, rejoice with them or have joy with them. Our joy is in believers, in people. When we get to fellowship together on Friday night at my house, we have a good time, don't we? And we laugh and joke with each other, but we don't laugh and joke with the world because the world is not interested in Christ. Oh, they may be Baptist or Pentecostals or Church of Christ or Charismatics and go to some so-called church, but there's no truth. It's all a twisting. Nobody knows what anything means, do they? It's just disgusting. And then Jesus says, and whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. You cannot be a learner without a daily cross. And how do you get rid of that man that cannot be satisfied with silver? You kill him off. He's self. That's our only problem, isn't it? I mean, I have sought fame and fortune as much as anybody I know. I have sought money. I've tried to get rich in real estate years ago. I've tried to do all these things for self, and I never had enough. But when you get to a certain age and you keep growing in faith and self begins to die out, you start saying, I don't need that other stuff. Besides that, if we seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these things will be added to us. But don't you listen to those charismatics. All these things does not mean Mercedes and Cadillacs and big homes. The context of that in Matthew 6, take no thought for your life, what you'll eat, what you'll drink, how you'll be clothed. It's about eating, drinking, and being clothed. That's what it's about. All these things, food, clothing, shelter. That's what it's about. All these things, look at that. I've heard Fred Price and these guys quote and Kenneth Copeland, all these things will be added to you. That shows you how they twist the word of God, don't they? Go here to Matthew 6. Matthew 6. All you have to do is define some words and you'll find out what these things mean. Right here in the middle, right here in the middle of the, uh, of the Sermon on the Mount, the Sermon on the Mount is Matthew 5, 6, and 7. It's first, Jesus' first message. First message he preached in northern Galilee. 
And he says here, remember we said that the word idolatry, idolatry is the word idololatria, E-I-D-O-L-O-L-A-T-R-E-I-A. That's the word idolatry in the Greek. That's the word idolatry. It comes from E-I-D-O and latruo. It means to, latruo means to serve or to be a servant. And ido means to see or perceive. Remember Ecclesiastes 1 and 8? The Bible says, The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. The mouth will not simply utter it. All things are full of labor. What do you put in your eyes and your ear? Now, this is where you get all that desire over there in Ecclesiastes 5. You get that from the fact that you're looking at all the things that you think you have to have. You go down to the, to the Ford showroom. You look at a $40,000 pickup that you couldn't buy in 100 years because you're making 20, 22000 a year. You might be able to buy it in 100 years, but you can't buy it in the next 5 or 10. You might be able to buy it when it's old and wore out. Or you might be looking at that woman that you have no business looking at, or that man you have no business looking at, or that money, or the wealth of others you have no business looking at. And we have that being put into our eyes on TV and the movies and, in the, and on the magazines and the radio and everywhere. We're being bombarded with this doctrine of the devil, the doctrine of distributing fortunes, aren't we? What are you going to do with it? It means to serve what you see. Well, look here what Jesus says in verse 23. If thine eye be evil, you're looking at the wrong things. Put the wrong thing in your eye. Thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and Money. The word mammon means money. You can't serve God in money. That's the way it is. But I think, how am I going to make a living? Nobody says you're not supposed to make a living. The priority in our lives should be Christ. Serve Christ. Get your job and your whole purpose of your job, whether it's at the grocery store, sacking groceries, or down here working for a computer company, should be to serve Christ. And while you're at it, do your job. Serve Christ, and while you're at it, drive a truck. Serve Christ, and while you're at it, be a roofer. Serve Christ, that should be priority in our life. And he says, if you do that, I'll take care of the rest. Then he says, no man can serve two masters. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life. Well, that's a heavy sentence, isn't it? Merim nao, take thought. Take thought is one word, M-E-R-I-M-N-A-O. It means to be distracted from the things of God by the things of this world, of world. In fact, when, when Peter says, be anxious for nothing, the word anxious is M-E-R-I-M-N-A, means worry. The thing that causes worry is I got to have this, I got to have that, I got to fix this, I got to pay that bill, I got to pay this, I got to finally get this or that. Take no thought for your life, what you'll eat, what you'll drink, eat, drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on. Eat, drink, clothing. Isn't that in that subject? Huh? Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? Isn't life more than the thickness of the steak and the tenderness of the steak? Isn't it more than a filet mignon? Is life more than that? Sometimes I just like bologna sandwiches with tomatoes on it and mayonnaise. Behold the fowls of the air. Look at the birds. 
For they sow not. They don't go out here and sow in the fields. They all got to plant me a crop for this next year. I ain't going to be able to eat. Here I'm a little sparrow. I got to get a bunch of sparrows. We're going to plant us a field. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not. Neither do they reap. And they don't gather into barns. They don't need that. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. <laughs> Are you not much better than the sparrows out there? Which of you by taking thought or worrying can add one cubit to his stature? Which of us by getting together, if worrying and taking thought for our life will fix your bills and all your problems, we'll all get into one big circle and we'll count to three. We'll say now on three, we're going to worry about his bills. And everybody do it all at once. One, two, three. Three, uh, 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 and then we'll get his bills solved. Okay, now let's go to her bills. One, two, three. Uh, uh, oh, oh, man! Uh, just we worry our way into getting bills fixed and and getting the plumbing fixed at home. Which of you, by taking thought, can fix anything? And why take you thought for clothing, raiment? Consider the lilies of the field; how they grow. They toil not, neither do they, do they spin. They don't work on a spinning wheel and spin their clothing on a spinning wheel. And, even, and yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. I plant a lot of flowers. Y'all know that in my house. I mean, I got, I planted probably 600 uh, petunias this past spring. Had beautiful petunias across the front of my house, and I got about 48 rose bushes. I love flowers. I had all kinds of other flowers. I had some uh, dianthus and some and some uh, zinnias, and I love zinnias. They grow anywhere. And I had just fields of stuff all over the place. And me and Mary would go outside and look and say, "God can't, man can't paint anything that looks like that. This is this is all dimensions, and it's gorgeous." And I got all these different colors. And the Bible says, God clothes them. <laughs> and he says, wherefore, if God will so clothe the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe ye, O ye of holy gospistus, puny faith? See, we only do that when our faith hasn't grown. What are we talking about? Food, clothing, drink. Isn't that what we're talking about? Therefore take no thought of saying, What shall we eat or what shall we drink? Wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth you have need. He knows what your needs are of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Now what does that mean? Cadillacs? No sir, it don't mean that. Does that mean a Mercedes, and does it mean a chalet up in Gatlinburg? And a, no. It means food and clothing. When you hear these charismatics say, all these things will be added to you. Say you have everything you want. Just speak it in your mouth. You bunch of liars. So he says, seek ye first the kingdom. Remember the word kingdom is basilius. And we said this morning the word basis comes from that. That means the foot or the walk. Seek to walk in God's kingdom. The kingdom of God is the church. It's Israel. That's an old ancient term for Israel. And we're spiritual Israel, the church. So we walk in Christ. And he's going to take care of us. And we're, if we're walking in Christ, how is he going to take care of us? Well, Paul says to the Corinthians in the 8th chapter of 2 Corinthians, he says... There needs to be a distribution so that the one has much and the one has little. There is an equality and nobody's going to starve. No one at grace and truth is going to starve as long as I'm pastor here. And nobody's going to stay out in the rain somewhere. We're going to look around and help you and I'm even going to help you. If I can, I'm going to call everybody I can, help you find a job. We're going to help each other and we're going to eat and we're going to drink and we're going to have clothing and you're not going to have to live out in the cold weather or in the heat that's because a family helps take care of each other don't we 
We're taking care of those missionaries as much as we can. We take care of a lot of poor people. That's what the Bible teaches. That's why when, when another verse these charismatics use over here in Mark, the 10th chapter, in Mark 10, they preach a money gospel, which is just not true. Mark 10. Now, we're talking about stuff, aren't we? We're talking about stuff. Stuff is matter. Stuff. Cars and houses and diamond rings and things like that. I don't even like, I wear a watch. I told the guy, I had this watch given to me. I said, I can't handle those big bulky watches with great big bands. I just can't handle them. They make me nervous and I'm going, my arm's breaking out. I said, I wear a watch to find out what time it is. Not to see what time it is in Hong Kong. I don't care what time it is in Hong Kong. <laughs> I got to know if I'm getting to church on time or if I'm getting to my doctor on time, my cardiologist on time. That's what I wear one for, nothing else. Don't wear any other jewelry. If you want to wear jewelry, that's up to you, but I don't wear it. I found it and don't people, make people respect me more. After I get through telling them God does not love everybody, it don't matter whether I go on a thousand dollar suit or the shorts I usually wear with a shirt that says God doesn't love everybody on it. Because they're not going to like me. They're not going to say, that makes me so mad. You said God doesn't love everybody. God does love everybody. John 3.16 says he loves everybody. I say, no, it doesn't. Yes, it does. No, it doesn't. Yes, it does. But I like your suit, Jim. All of a sudden, in the middle of it, they stop and say, I like your suit. So I'm just, they're not going to do that. So I'm just going to wear my shorts out in public, my T-shirts. And I'll have one on tomorrow. As long as I can wear them till the winter gets here. I wear them, I run around in my shorts. Sometimes I preach on Sunday night in my shorts with a t-shirt on that says, uh, there's no such thing as faith healing. And I have people call me on my t-shirts. Now, where was I? Mark. Here's another way they misinterpret this verse here. We're talking about how do you get over stuff? That's the doctrine of the devil, isn't it? Doctrine of the devil means to distribute fortunes. The love of money is the love of self is the root of all evil. And self can never be satisfied. Solomon said that over and over again. Self cannot be satisfied. Kill off self. You say, but Jim, that daily cross, it makes life miserable. No, it doesn't. When you get to a place and you grow in faith and you get rid of self, you won't do it. God will be getting rid of it. You it's like that wooden thing that guy made for me over there. Self must decrease and faith increases. Christ increases in my life. Self has to do this. And it'll be a long time coming and this is the way it works. You start life with a whole lot of great big self and you have to decrease and you'll decrease through the fire and the trials when you belong to God. And self will get very small if you get old enough. And you'll keep getting smaller and smaller. And he must increase, but self must decrease. That's what John the Baptist meant. He must increase, but self must decrease. He'll increase in our lives. Faith will increase. Besides all this, give all diligence. Add to your faith. And he names seven things to add. So he says here, Peter began to say unto Jesus in verse 28. This is after Jesus spoke to the rich young ruler. said, sell all that you have and give to the poor. Because he knew the rich young ruler was covetous. And the rich young ruler went, went away sad. He was covetous about things and stuff and money. And Jesus said, you got a problem with self. You need to give it all away. He wouldn't have said that if the man hadn't have been covetous. If he'd like to chase women, he'd say, you're going to, have to quit chasing women. He, Christ zeroes in on what problem we have. If he likes drugs or drinking, he'll say, you have to quit that. You can't follow Christ and have self at the same time. Then Peter began to send him in verse 28, Lo, we have left all and have followed thee. And Jesus answered and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, there is no man that hath left house, or brethren, or sisters, or mother, or father, or wife, or children, or lands for my sake and the gospels, but he shall receive 
and hundredfold. See, praise God. Whoa, yeah, whoa. You get hundredfold. A hundredfold what? Let's look and see what it says. A hundredfold, now in this time, houses. You mean you get a hundred houses? Well, let me, let's finish reading it. And brethren, if the houses are literal, the brethren are literal, aren't they? Jesus, didn't Jesus say in Mark, the third chapter, who is my mother and my brothers and my sisters? It's those who do the will of the Father. So he's talking about spiritual brethren. Spiritually, he must mean houses. It can be my house or it can be your house or it can be me getting a place for you to stay down at the motel until you can get you a job and get things going. It's sharing what we have with others. That's what it's talking about. And then he says, and sisters. If the houses is literal, so are the brothers and sisters. Your mother's got to become pregnant a hundred more times to get you a hundred brothers, a hundred more times to get you a hundred sisters. But God's going to make that easy if this is literal. And mothers. That way, if you get you a hundred mothers, they're all going to have one child apiece, or two child, two children apiece which each one of them will have a son and a daughter, right? This is ridiculous. You can't just stop at a hundredfold houses. And sisters and mothers and children and lands, they never get to the next phrase, with persecutions. Wherever Paul went, the people took him into their homes, and their home was his home. When you're 100% serving God and you get run off from somewhere for serving God and telling truth, people, they won't like you. They'll put you through tribulation. He says, with persecution in the world to come and eternal life. There's a promise. There's a promise. And eternal life. These people who don't look at the full text of Scripture... This cannot possibly be talking about, if you leave all, he's going to give you a hundred houses. If you don't get a hundred houses, then there's something wrong with your life. If you get a hundred houses, you get a hundred mothers. Don't you? Huh? Isn't that what he's saying? Well, look, it says a hundredfold houses, mothers, brothers, and sisters. Look at Mark, the third chapter. Jesus is in a house. They came unto him, his brethren and his mother, in verse 31. They were coming from Galilee. That's where Jesus was from, northern Israel. Standing outside, sent unto him, calling. And the multitude sat about and said unto him, Behold, your mother and your brothers are outside the house seeking you, and the, and the press is too great for them to get inside. And he answered them and said, Who is my mother or my brethren? What if I said, Who is my hundredfold mothers? Who is my hundredfold brothers? And he looked around about him, which said about him, and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren, for whosoever shall do the will of the Father, the same as my brother and my sister and my mother. That's the hundredfold brothers, hundredfold mothers, hundredfold sisters. It's not literal. If the houses is literal, so are the sisters and the mothers and the brothers. John Avanzini will quote that and say, I'm going to pray the hundredfold blessing. You give us $10,000 and you'll get 100000 back. Or you get a million back. And, and their ship never comes in, does it? Let me show you something else these charismatics do. They say you sit with your mouth and you get it, but I hadn't brought this out in a long time. Go over here to Isaiah 54. And they're false teachers. They preach a money gospel. They say if you sit with your mouth, you get it. I don't hear any of them defining any words. Isaiah is a prophet prophesying the, the downfall of Israel. Isaiah's prophecies are about Israel being attacked by the Assyrians and southern Judah being attacked by the Babylonians if God's going to destroy Israel. We know that in 722 B.C., the northern Israel was carried away into captivity by the Syrians in 722 B.C. I put 723. 722 B.C. Assyrians 
carried Israel away into captivity And David said, the wicked are the sword of the Lord. So the Assyrians would be the sword, wouldn't they? David said in the 17th Psalm, deliver me from the wicked, which is thy sword in thy hand. The reason God raised the sword against Israel is because for 500 years, they went after Baal, Grove. Baal was the sun god. Grove was the tree goddess. She was a tree that would not rot an evergreen, a Christmas tree. And for 500 years, they went after this system. This is the same system that Constantine brought in the church and renamed Christ Mass. Christmas is Roman Catholicism. It's against the law to celebrate Christmas 300 years ago in America. Now, for 500 years, and God says, I'll send four judgments, the sword, the famine, the pestilence, and finally I'll send the beast, and that's Babylon, Persia, Greece, and then Rome, Babylon will carry southern Judah into captivity and Persia will overthrow Greece and keep Judah into captivity. They'll give decrees, but they won't go back. Greece will have Judah in captivity and Rome will have Judah and Israel in captivity. So they carry them off and they're a sword of God. Now look here. <clears throat> and Isaiah's prophesying. He's prophesying here approximately 712 B.C. That's approximately 10 years after northern Israel has been carried captive. Not only were they carried captive, they were slaughtered. Northern Israel was slaughtered by the Assyrians. Just barbaric butchers come in and murdering women in the streets. The Bible says in Hosea, the 13th chapter, they came in and ripped the bellies of the women open. And God said, I will not pity. Well, in 712... Isaiah writes these words, and you'll hear the Charismatics read this. And they imply that your enemies cannot hurt you when, when it says this. <clears throat> Let me see here. We don't want to start reading. Let's read in 16 and 17. Behold, I have created the smith that bloweth the coals in the fire, bringeth forth an instrument for his work, and I have created the waster to destroy. I created Assyria to come in and slaughter Israel and carry them away into captivity. Then these famous words in the next verse, charismatics use, to, and they imply that nobody can hurt you. That's not what it says. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. And they'll say, have you heard him quote that? No weapon formed against you to prosper. They can't hurt you and they can't get you. That's not what it's saying. It's saying the weapon will not continue to go forward. It doesn't mean that the sword that God used to cut down Israel wasn't going to hurt Israel because they were slaughtered, wasn't they? And he says these words around 712, at least around 10 to 12, 15 years after they have been slaughtered and cut to the ground. And southern Judah is carried away into captivity and slaughtered in 586 B.C. And Jeremiah tells the people, if you try to run from Nebuchadnezzar, I'll have them soldiers chase you down in Egypt and they'll cut you to the ground. And these words were spoken between the two slaughterings of Israel. And the charismatics were saying, no weapon formed against you will prosper. The weapon won't hurt you. Well, when he said these words... Hundreds of thousands of Jews had been slaughtered and murdered by the Assyrians and then hundreds of thousands more and millions will be carried into captivity in 586. But see, they don't know nothing about the history of Israel. So they just pull this verse out. No weapon formed against you will prosper and we're going to keep on singing and shouting playing the drums real loud till you give us all your money and then you'll believe it. The stuff they're saying is idiocy. I wanted you to see when these words were spoken, northern Israel had already been slaughtered and cut to the ground. Southern Judah not only was slaughtered, many years after this, these words were spoken. Southern Judah was just... Nebuchadnezzar came in, burnt the city to the ground, the city of Jerusalem because of their apostasy, burnt it to the ground, annihilated Jerusalem, 
they would, when they annihilated the city, they would burn it, burn everything that could be burnt, pull the walls down, they'd take a plow and plow, plow it up, plow X's through it, and then they would go in and salt the city down so nothing would grow there anymore. And Jerusalem looked like a wasteland in 586 when Nebuchadnezzar came in and carried him away captive. What do you mean no weapon will prosper against you? No, no. Assyria will, it's talking about Assyria will slaughter you and then I'll cut them down for doing it. And I'll have them do it. That's the sovereignty of God. And I'll have southern Judah carried away by Babylon and they'll be slaughtered and burnt to the ground. No weapon formed against you will prosper means Babylon's not going to continue. Because they're cut down by the, Greece, by the Persians in 539 B.C. And Babylon destroys Assyria in 605. The weapons are destroyed. It doesn't mean they're not going to do their damage on Israel, does it? No, no. It's the weapon that won't continue. But the weapon, when God raises a weapon against his people, he will accomplish what he sends it to do. Now, how much time do I have? Six. Gosh. This was my introduction. <laughs> We've been talking about the doctrine of the devil, and I'll just read a couple more verses. What is it that deceives men and leads them away? Deceives them. You know, I have gone through a lot of these things. What deceives men is when these preachers take the Word of God without looking at the full context and they twist it and wrench it. And they twist the Word of God. There's some favorite verses. When southern Judah was carried into captivity in 586, in 586, when they were carried into captivity, they were over here in Babylon. In Babylon. And Babylon is overthrown in 539 by the Persians. And then in 520 B.C. Move this over here. No, that's too... No, I blocked too many faces there. In 520 B.C., This is when Haggai and Zechariah are telling Israel to get busy and rebuild the, the temple, which the decree had been given in 538 to rebuild the temple, and they quit building because they got so much opposition for, from 536 B.C., until 520. For 16 years they weren't rebuilding the temple. And Zechariah prophesied some words that the Charismatics pulled completely out of context. Israel is in captivity in Babylon under the rule of the Persian Empire when he says these words in Zechariah. Zechariah, fourth chapter. Now they'll use, <clears throat> the way you preach the doctrine of the devil, you pull out verses that are convenient for you and you twist the context to make it mean something it doesn't mean so you can excite people and make them go, whoopee, hey, great, wonderful. Start jumping up and down and hopping and skipping and doing cartwheels. This message is not a popular message. And he says here, this is Zechariah talking, and the angel, in verse 5, chapter 4, Zechariah, the angel that talked with me answered and said unto me, Knowest thou not what these seven candlesticks be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zechar Zerubbabel. Now, Zerubbabel was a Jewish governor. He was a descendant of Judah. He is in the first chapter of Matthew, He's in Jesus' lineage. <coughs> they were not allowed to have kings. 
since they weren't allowed to have kings, they picked out one of the descendants of the king lineage of Judah, and he would have been king if the Persian Empire had allowed him to have kings. Saying, this is the word of the Lord saying, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Now, that's a Pentecostal verse. They go, whoopee, not by might, not by power. Whoa! By my spirit, saith the Lord. I, and the Holy Spirit's going to get a hold of us and we're going to do cartwheels. That ain't what that's talking about. That's talking about Israel is in captivity in 520. And God's going to move up on these Persian kings and the Spirit of God is going to come to Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes and cause them to give decrees to release Israel from their captivity and send them back home to rebuild the temple, to rebuild the temple in the city. And those decrees are given in Ezra the first chapter, Ezra the sixth chapter, Ezra the seventh chapter, and Nehemiah the second chapter. And the, the kings that give these are Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes. Not by might. It will not be a mighty army that liberates Israel from captivity. It will not be a powerful structured army in Israel. Not by might, not by power. But by my spirit, when God goes to these kings, puts it in their minds to give the decrees for Israel to go back and rebuild. That has nothing about Pentecostalism and jumping up and down and speaking in tongues going, Whoopee! I did a message on this one time and I called it the Whoopee Gospel. That's not what this is about. It has a meaning. You can't just make up meanings. People who don't study the history of Israel, if they know nothing about 1 Samuel all the way through 2 Chronicles, that's Israel as a history. If they don't know about their being scattered for the fact that all the time they were a nation from 1 Chronicles to 2, from 1 Samuel to 2 Chronicles, this is the books of the kings where they constantly went after Baal, Grove, Shemash, Molech, and God scattered them. If you don't know that they were scattered and they're over here in Babylon being ruled by the Persians, you're not even going to know what that verse means. Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. I'm going to touch the hearts of these kings and cause them to give decrees to send Israel home. That, uh, what I'm trying to really impress on you tonight is the way that false teachers pull a verse out and twist it all to pieces. That's called being froward. That's called perversion. But what I preach is not popular. When you correct the Charismatics and the Baptists, and the, I know Baptist. I was ordained a Southern Baptist preacher in a Southern Baptist church. My father was an independent Baptist preacher. I had preached in Baptist churches across America. They don't know anything about the Bible. They don't know anything about the history of Israel. Oh, they know Elijah, Daniel, Noah. Say, I know history. Built an ark, didn't he? I'm so sick of preachers who have been lazy. I've spent 57 years studying this book. No small amount of time. I love the Word of God. I love to impart it to you. I, I'm not just out to attack these preachers. People get mad at me for calling people's names and calling them down. Yet the Bible has got hundreds and hundreds of verses that go after false teachers and false prophets. It's about two doctrines. It's either the doctrine of the devil or the doctrine of Christ. The doctrine of Christ is crucify self. That's the only thing that will make you content and happy. The doctrine of the devil is fulfill self and you'll never be happy. Because you can never, ever satisfy the flesh. You may not know that now, but you sure will know it when you get older. You can't satisfy yourself. You say, I'm young, I'll get it. Look, I used to be young and cute. But I'm old and not cute anymore. Let me tell you. Solomon said, there's something that's common to all men and all animals. As the dog dies, so does man. You're going to die one day. You're going to get old. You're going to have wrinkles. 
I couldn't do that when I was 32 right there. I could not grab my face, the skin of my face. I could not get a hold of my belly like that. I didn't have, I couldn't get any fat on me till I was nearly 40. You're going to get old. And you'll find out as a believer. What's really sad is the unbelievers keep on trying to fulfill the flesh and they can't do it either. And they never quit when they're 85 or 90. Bill Gates has got 65 billion dollars. That's a million dollars 65,000 times. He has made a million dollars 65,000 times and you can't even make it once. And he is not happy because he wants more. He's an idolater. Covetousness is idolatry. The cross, the daily cross, Jesus said, if any man will come after let him deny himself and take up his cross daily. The whole idea of the cross is not something to hurt you. It's something to comfort you since you can't get rid of this desire that goes on in self. All the juices that say, I want, can never be satisfied. What helps you get rid of that desire is getting old enough. Age will really help you a lot if you get old. Just pray God will make you old real fast. That will help a lot. Because you get to the place you say, all the things I used to want. Solomon put it this way, Remember thy creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, when your age comes not, nor the years draw nigh and you get old, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in the days of my youth anymore. That happens to everybody. Every human being that's ever lived will say, I don't, ha I don't want to go to the fair. Please don't make me. You're going to have to tie me up and tie my arms behind my back to get me to the fair. Please don't make me go. And I couldn't wait till I got there at 15, even 20 years old. But now you're going to have to hog time me to get me there. I may go to the exhibits, but I will not go down on that midway. No. I'd, I'd just rather you'd say, Jim, you can either go to the fair and walk down the midway, or we'll beat you with a bull whip out here in the parking lot. I'd say, beat me with a whip. It, it'd be over quick. That's torture to me. And we all get there, don't we? I used to drive around town, downtown Beaumont and had a 49 Chevrolet that had a hole in the floorboard. And I'd turn my radio to high as it would go and there was Chuck Berry, Johnny Be Good, you know, and there was Fast Domino and there was Elvis and they, all my radio burn. We didn't have any boom boxes, but I did the same thing the kids do today. I'd go out and drive around the pig stand. It was a barbecue place and little car hops coming out there and I'd have some girl with me. We'd drive around around the radio blaring. And I can't stand that. Some guy runs up beside me and goes, boom, 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 boom. I'm going, can you turn that up? I can't hear it. <laughs> I've done that many times. They're going, what? <laughs> turn it up. <laughs> I can't stand it. I just, and young people, well, that sounds great. Anybody likes it. No, you don't. When you get wore out with life, you don't. Let's pray. Father, thank you for truth. God, help us to understand this flesh. It makes us miserable. We can never fix it. You said it can't be fixed, these desires. Help the church to grow. Help them to mature in the faith. God, we pray for the ministry. You'll open up many doors, many TV stations, and open up opportunities throughout the world for the internet and fight all of our battles. We've got many, many enemies that want to stop us. Lord, you, the only evil they can do is what you will allow them to do. Strengthen us, lead us to your elect. We give you praise for everything in Christ's name. Amen. Oh gosh, I can cut it. If I had a knife, I could just cut it. Whew. But I liked it when I was young, so so I guess I'll have to put up with it. Did I say, I think I said Little Richard. No, I meant Chuck Berry. Chuck Berry was Johnny Be Good. And little Richard was Long Tall Sally.
voice? Oh, my voice is trying to give away on me. I don't know what's happening. Something's happening. Huh? Uh, I'm fine. Thank you. Thank you. Then you. As Lucy said to... As Lucy, David, Desi said to Lucy, then you. Then you. Then you. Let me go see some of these folks. Take some of each of those and take one of each of these DVDs up here. All those are tracks that I wrote and they're very, very good study tracks because I've got a lot of Greek words in there. Love hey, morning, I go to work. love you too, brother. You too, Warren. You're going to work right, you're now? now? I'm going to home get, get some sleep. Yes, I'm going to work. That's what I'm yeah. at. Four o'clock. Tell everybody, tell Corrine and the gang we said hey. I will.